Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello welcome once again to NPTEL the national program on technology enhanced learning which is a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, these lectures are um, for the students in engineering colleges um, in our country and um, I am sure those of you who are uh, students of the humanities and social sciences would also find these lectures useful uh, in uh, the engineering institutes, the humanities and social sciences and disciplines offer um, elective courses, uh, some of them are also core courses and uh, our course cultural studies uh, is a course that I teach um, in uh, teach at IIT Guwahati. I am Lisa and we are in module 3 uh, of cultural studies. We have alway, already done um, two lectures, already discussed um, uh, two lectures. These were to do with the body and space. This third module is as you know devoted to sites, S I T E S sites of cultural studies. Uh, this I have done in a bid to to show you how the theories and key concepts that we learned in uh, the last two modules uh, may be uh, applied or located in various um, aspects of our lives. So, today's lecture is entitled Time, Time as seen in cultural studies. As always we do a recap of what we discussed in uh, the last lecture. The last lecture you would recall uh, was devoted to space, uh, the way space is seen in uh, cultural theory in cultural studies and we looked uh, through a book by Pramod uh, Nair. We uh, came uh, upon Doreen Massey's theorization of space as social and we found that space is not simply geographical space or space as we understood it in probably in, um, in primary school, uh, space is deeply social. And if you look at the slide, space is symbolic, space is a social construct, space is dynamic, space has to do with power, space is multi-layered as uh, an entity as a, even as a concept and there are also contradictory issues relating to space. We, you will also recall that as a social construction space has to do with some of the most important areas of our lives and these were as we saw in the last, la uh, last lecture, these are work, family, leisure, consumption and also privacy. Okay? In this way space is a social construct because it has um, has very important implications okay, for our um, various aspects of our social and cultural lives. And the next point was to do with space and power and space and power you will recall Michel Foucault who had said that a history of space is at once a history of power. So, how is power implicated in space? Power is implicated in space according to the slide. Uh, because it has to do, space has to do with aspects of power like access, like significance, like relevance and like authority. Okay? Uh, who has access to space? Okay? What are the rules regarding trespassing for instance? Uh, what is the signif uh, significance uh, with respect to power okay, of different spaces or different kinds of spaces? Okay? and how, how are certain spaces more relevant than the others and hence imbued with more power and 
who has authority over certain spaces. So, we saw in, uh, in the last um, uh, you know last lecture that things like space for instance, which uh, initially may not have been thought by many to have to do with our life with living with our ways of life uh, is also uh, another uh, an important site where uh, you know power politics, the social are all implicated. Okay. So, space is no longer you know a, a sort of neutral a neutral topographical uh, area. Then we also saw very briefly that um, as far as urban studies is concerned as far as studying a space in the city is concerned, there are different ways different um, you know even movements even philosophical movements, um, even different theoretical movements and many people have been working on the uh, various aspects of space. And these are for instance, the Chicago school uh, working on plant life and ecology, uh, postmodernism uh, and space, okay. then power and surveillance. Uh, David Harvey's for instance, um, the economic you know the city as a site of economic development, restructuring and investment, uh, the city as text uh, may be another way of doing cultural studies okay, on the city. Well, so today's lecture is time, time uh, is obviously with um, you know students of engineering and the sciences uh, in physics time is something you have studied from the point of view of physics from the point of view of of um, of um, um, the physical sciences as it were okay so well let's see what cultural studies has to say about time and how time is looked at in um, in cultural theory um, let us look at the key to the source text for this lecture from where I will be taking several points and from where I will be also from time to time to time quoting um, certain very important statements by these uh, critics and scholars. They are these books are critical and cultural theory by Danny Cavallaro, cultural studies theory and practice the book you are familiar with by now Chris Parker. Uh, cultural theory and anthology by Ziman and Kaposi. So, basically there are many of course, there are many books, uh, there are several articles to do with um, time and the way it is looked at the way it is theorized in cultural studies, but for you know um, uh, the fact that we do not have um, enough time and just within um, the you know the limits of, a, of one lecture we have to talk about time in cultural studies. So, I would be looking at these texts. Well, let us begin with philosophy and let us be, uh, begin uh, you know uh, several you know years hundreds of years ago. Um, in philosophy time uh, has or a, uh, you know, time was looked at okay? uh, not as a simple given right. Philosophers as uh, the Greek philosophers beginning with the Greek philosophers a uh, time has been problematized um, ever since. Okay? Uh, now, in philosophy let us look at this slide, there are two views with regard to time. One view looks at time as static okay? uh, in the sense that uh, real objects so look at Parmenides, the philosopher Parmenides. Okay? Parmenides and others held that real objects, okay? real objects are immutable, right? real objects have nothing to do with change. Right. Real objects are always there, almost like the Platonic forms, for instance, the forms that are universal, forms that are eternal. So, in that sense, one school of thought looked at um, time as static and you know, real objects, objects that are there forever, objects that are eternal, objects that matter, okay, have nothing to do with change, and hence they were called immutable. The other aspect, other view is the called the dynamic view of, um, of uh, a time uh, which accepts the fact with philosophers like Heraclitus accepts the change uh, accepts mutability accepts time as a flow for instance okay, where time is not static but dynamic and this is something that you have I am sure most of us have uh, you know come across this statement that one cannot step into the same river twice. Okay. 
comparing the flow of time with the flow of water. So, if you step into uh, a river for instance, then the you know uh, if you step step into it uh, you know just a couple of minutes later you are not really uh, stepping into the same river because the water is different the water has flowed so the flow of water like the flow of um, uh, so sorry flow of time like the flow of of rivers for instance uh, is the dynamic notion of time so what are the two views of uh, time in philosophy that we have seen the two major schools of thought are those of immutability of where real objects have no change okay and the other one or, or is, is of being time being dynamic where there is time flows uh, for instance you know the metaphor of a river for instance okay so these are the two views of philosophy when cultural studies problematizes I want to uh, you know uh, state this in the beginning, when, pro when uh, cultural studies problematizes time, it is not that it is doing this has been done for the first time okay, since a very since very long ago okay, philosophers had already problematized time. Now, uh, looking at how Danny Cavallaro in his book critical and cultural theory on his uh, you know in his essay entitled time, he says that there are three we may we may say that there are three central issues okay when we study time in cultures and critical theory uh, one may be this that our grasp of time influences our perception of the world meaning the way you look at time for instance if you consider time as static okay then your perception of the world would be dependent on it if you consider time uh, like uh, Heraclitus did as something dynamic as uh, you know as a flow right in that sense too your perception of the world would differ this is more more than really strictly speaking a cultural studies question this is more a question in philosophy then the relationship between time and space is not something simply to do with physics okay but it is also a matter for exploration in cultural studies and importantly I would say the relationship between time and history right. So, uh, as Cavallaro says there we can place these under three broad you know or what he calls central issues that is our grasp of time our understanding of time okay, uh, also determines the way we perceive the world our perceptions of the world the way we even understand the world the way we understand life the way we understand the universe and second the relationship between time and space and third the relationship between time uh, time past time present for instance and history ok. So, uh, we would be looking at these uh, in, th in this lecture we will be looking at time broadly through this and also from a couple of other aspects. Well, what was the traditional con uh, concept of time ok. If you ask many, many, many people they would say that well uh, they would go by the traditional concepts or views of time and they would say that time is tele you know teleological, teleological from the word telos or having an end right. This view this traditional uh, traditionalist view of time holds that things are moving to uh, sometimes a, you know some would say a predestined end. Okay. So, things unfold, time unfolds, things unfold, events unfold, okay. even history unfolds to a certain designated end or a desig, you know designate there is something that to which we are all you know uh, sort of um, life unpacks so to speak towards that certain end. That view is known as the teleological view that is with a purpose okay, towards a certain end. The other obviously the opposite would be a non teleological view okay, where there is no uh, given end to which we which our lives unfold. Uh, also a traditional uh, concept um, because also it is linear right is the evolutionary view of time right the time you know uh, particularly if you look at the evolution of species right it need not be teleological it need not be working itself towards uh, towards um, it was a certain goal predestined goal okay preordained goal nevertheless it is seen as a history of progress for instance if you look at um, darwinian uh, you know uh, evolutionary theorizing you will see that species move from have evolved from very 
small uh, uh, you know uh, organisms from the amoeba for instance to uh, homo sapiens. So, there is a certain linear linearity uh, to it which have we have mentioned here ok. Uh, the li a linear uh, progressive so to speak to do with progress ok. okay? Uh, sometimes it may be uh, punctuated right as we, we have the concept of punctuated equilibrium for instance in evolutionary theory. However, the overall framework is we may say a traditionalist framework. So, what the in, in, in traditional concepts of time, time is teleological, time is evolutionary, time is progressive in that sense and time is linear. Okay? So, what cultural studies does is problematize uh, these and to show that uh, you know one may one may talk about something else than this way of looking at time. Now, I uh, being um, from literature, okay, being really trained in literature, uh, I cannot help but bring uh, to your notice these four, uh, these five lines from um, T. S. Eliot, the poet T. S. Eliot's uh, four quartets. This I would, with this I would like to begin the problematization of time, and let's read it. These lines are really beautiful. Time present and time past are both present in time future, and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. Let us look at this again, time present and time past are both present in time future. Okay, this, is, this is what we call understanding time not in a linear way of past, present and future. Okay. Our understanding of uh, the world, our understanding of ourselves okay, uh, is not only in the present. Right. So, both time past and time future are also present um, in the present and time past and time uh, present are also present in time future. This is a poetic way of showing that our understanding of time is a little more complex than the traditional concepts. Uh, a quotation from the famous uh, historian E. H. Carr and some of you would, uh, if, uh, would be familiar with the text uh, with his very famous text what is history. right? So, I will uh, just touch upon and come back to history again just to show you how it has even the, the last point made by you know the, the three central issues the last mentioned by Cavallaro that is looking at time and history. Uh, this is what Carr has to say, say as far as history is concerned and our understanding of time. No document let us read from here, no document can tell us more than what the author of the document thought, what he thought had happened, what he thought ought to happen or would happen or perhaps only what he wanted others to think he thought or even only what he himself thought he thought. None of these means anything until the historian has got to work on it and deciphered it. Okay? So, like time, like the problematization of time, history too is seen not as a given. Okay? History is seen as deeply informed by the historian, by deeply informed by uh, you know uh, by, by the, the person of you know the historian or even sometimes maybe uh, the personality in, in the sense of, sense of uh, the perceptions of the historian. Okay? So, like time even history is not something that is innocent, pristine and given. Now, the facts whether found in documents or not have still to be processed by the historian before he can make any use of them. Okay? So, in the, even if he has gleaned something from the past, the historian is at the present okay? and the, this presence both presence and, and this if I may use the word presentness of the historian uh, is uh, you know the agent that is the agency through which the past is brought to us. So, the past is already colored by the present. Okay? How by the present? By the fact that the historian is in the present. So, the facts whether found in documents or not have still to be processed by the historian before he can make any use of them. The use he makes of them is if I may put it that way the processing process and this processing process cultural studies would you know theorists would uh, link this with E. H. Carr's statement. This processing process is something that happens in the 
present. Okay? So, this is how the present has a hold over the past. We can never know the past in all its so called pristineness. Right? Therefore, by now we have found if you look at the slide that time has by now for us uh, become an unstable entity. Okay? This is uh, something which we cannot grasp in a very simplistic way, something which is not stable in the sense stable in the sense or it is an unstable entity in the sense uh, in the sense that uh, it does not offer us any certainties. Right? Even time which is taken for granted by us particularly by the traditional concepts of teleology and linearity for uh, linearity for instance, okay, these are no longer tenable in our understanding of, of time. For instance, uh, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant okay, uh, had proposed this in the 18th century. He said that time as an a priori cognitive is an is an a priori cognitive schema which we human beings impose on reality instead of being a feature of reality. Okay? Now, it will be very difficult I am sure for many of you to, to accept this, but Kant made an important distinction between reality and our cognitive apparatuses. Okay? Uh, he was certainly not the first to point this out, but, Im, but, an, but importantly he showed us that there were certain categories okay, through which we view the world, there are certain cognitive um, which, uh, which, has to, which has to do with cognitive schemas, which has uh, to do with certain ways of perceiving, okay. our brains are of a certain kind. So, we perceive reality with certain uh, schemas or ways of looking. right? which are hardwired in us in the sense that they are a priori. A priori means they are uh, hardwired into our cognitive system and he includes time as an a priori cognitive schema. Okay. Uh, time therefore, as an, as an a priori cognitive uh, is an a priori cognitive schema which we impose on reality. Okay. Look, look at what Kant is saying, Kant say, is saying that uh, time is not a feature of reality that we can grasp and we can see and we can understand oh this is the flow of time. Time he says is something in us right. Of course, we know this is also problematic we cannot accept it uh, just as it is mentioned, okay. but, th but that time is already problematized by the 18th century uh, is you know uh, is proven by statements like those given by Immanuel Kant. Okay. And of course, as students of science you would, uh, you would also understand very readily the concept of relativity of time as given by Albert Einstein. So, we find here that both in philosophy and in the sciences, okay, time has um, you know by the 19th 20th century time has never been really uh, what he calls uh, what we can call a stable concept time is always an unstable entity. Okay. So, how do we grapple with time in? So, this, this lecture is, is, is you know an attempt from my side to bring to you these various contours of the problematization of science in, in philosophy in cultural the and critical theory. Now, uh, I mentioned this book uh, this anthology by Z Mann and Timothy Kaposi and they have uh, you know, uh, they have spoken about time in uh, their anthology in the introduction um, to the section on time uh, with specific in specific relation to cultural studies. Now, let us let us uh, look at how they have articulated it in their book. Now, according to Zeman and uh, Kaposi, cultural studies of temporality that is of time okay, of temporality is not concerned with the fundamental characteristics of time. Okay. So, this may be a difference a valuable a very important difference okay, uh, between looking at time in, in science and looking at time uh, in, in, in the humanities. Okay. Whereas, perhaps uh, the central issue in, uh, in uh, science could be what is the fundamental what are the fundamental characteristics of time as an entity. So, Zeman and Kaposi said we uh, cultural studies people have written cultural studies uh, the evidence is that we are not concerned okay, as te, uh, or concerned with temporality and the as a fundamental study of temporality as a fundamental um, you know exploration into the qualities or characteristics of time. Okay. 
So, if not if that is not the case then what, what are we going to study uh, we, uh, in cultural studies with relation to time. He, they say here the second point, uh, the, the important question in cultural studies to do with time is this, how do we understand time in relation to human life activities. This you will understand is similar to the question of space right. In the last lecture, we talked about you know the importance of space in uh, studying space in cultural studies as how is space social, right? How is uh, space not simply topographical? How is space social? The similar questions are asked in cultural studies of time, for instance. Or how do we understand time? Not as you know, not with regard to its fundamental features, which may be uh, you know the aim of the aim of uh, the sciences, but Okay, how do we understand time in relation to our human social cultural activities? That is where the issue of time comes in. Next, the point they make is how do the past, okay, how do the past and the future affect our socio cultural present? Okay, the next important thing, therefore, is how even though we live in the present, right, even though we live in the present, how is the present affected? by something that is no longer there that is the past and something that is coming that is the future. Okay. So, it means that recall T. S. Eliot the poet's line okay. time present and time past are both contained in time future or time you know both the past and the future are always with us in the present. So, that a seemingly you know a seemingly correct statement or you know an innocent statement like I live in the present is a highly problematic one. When I say I live in the present, I do my socio, social activities, my cultural activities, my living in the present, it is not as simple as it looks like, because all our actions are affected if not determined by uh, the past and by uh, you know uh, by the future. Okay? So, this is the second point in relation to time uh, that cultural studies is concerned with our lives. Then finally, how is history related to culture and how is that is how is history related to time in culture. Okay. So, we can stay with these very uh, you know uh, seminal points, I am not saying that these are the only three uh, you know ways in which or Cavalier or that Cavalero's uh, you know three central issues uh, are the only issues, these are not the uh, not the only issues definitely. But for the purposes of this lesson, okay, it, it suffices for us to look at these questions. Now, to do with history and time, the third point raised by uh, Cavallaro. Okay. Now, I am quoting from Zeman and Kaposi, and this is how they have looked, uh, uh, they have theorized uh, regard on, on time and history. Now, let us read this carefully. History is not a narrative shaped by time. Let us mark this, history is not a narrative shaped by time, but rather one shaped around this is important changing ideas about temporality. Okay. So, we cannot say in a very simplistic way that uh, you know uh, history is of course, a story, a narrative right, a telling of tales uh, uh, which is shaped by time, we cannot say that it is not enough to say that. Okay history is about changing conceptions of time. Now, history is shaped around changing ideas or changing conceptions of temporality of time. Right? Its flow, let us read this, its flow, movement and direction, which immediately betray or uh, that is they reveal, okay? they betray our preconceptions and assumptions about the broader forces that give shape and form to culture and society and our sense of social time itself. Okay. So, history is conditioned then, history is conditioned not simply by our understanding of the past, history is conditioned by our, our changing, ever changing ideas about what, it, what time means. Okay, what time means in the social front, right? and it betrays or it reveals our own understanding, our own preconceptions. Right? Sometimes perhaps our own biases, okay, our own preconceptions uh, and assumptions about, about what? About the forces that create our sociocultural lives and give that 
that is how they put it that gives shape and form to culture and society and to our sense of social type. Cultural theories now coming down particularly to cultural theories, cultural theories which deal with time are interested in what are interested in this let us mark this interested in understanding the uses to which narratives of time or temporality have been put. Coming down to the basics of cultural studies that is are okay we we as they have shown us we know by now that history is to do not with simply narrating something uh, that is shaped by time but by our changing ideas about what time means or what social time means right um, in cultural theory what is the, you could say that this this may this is something to do with even historiography or the philosophy of history so how is the philosophy of history then different from cultural studies. You have to really pare it down and see how these are different, right. The philosophy of history may also consider itself with these questions, temporality, past and present, history, narration, etcetera. What we do in cultural studies is how these changing ideas of temporality, how our conceptions of what he calls, what they call the broader forces that shape our lives, okay how these have been as it says here put to use, who has put this to use for, for what purposes which is always the central question which is always the central motive of cultural studies. Okay. So, let us read this part again cultural theories which deal with time are interested in understanding the uses to which narratives of temporality have been put and their implications both their uses and their implications for how we imagine who and what we are and might yet become. I think this is a huge question. Okay. So, if time history uh, the narration of history is something that can be used by certain agencies, okay, these have huge implications for us because they will also determine and uh, that is that is they will also affect Okay. The way we perceive ourselves, the way for instance here, the way we imagine who we are, right? even questions of our you know of our um, uh, ultimately who we are, why we are, we are here for instance, why we are on this planet for, even for instance, what our identity is, what is our ultimate sort of what we call the ultimate goal is if there is one, okay. these or why uh, or, or who we, we are, how do we define ourselves and what we may become that is to what goals should we aspire or you know all these are not simply issues of say identity and subjectivity as we understand these identity and subjectivity are also colored by the way people have uh, people have you know uh, put to use the changing conceptions of time. Okay. That is why time is such an important concept time is an important site location of, uh, uh, of uh, in philosophy in the philosophy of history for instance and in, in cultural studies. So, we would do well to keep this the political aspect of time and its uses our understandings of time. Another way in which cultural studies has seen time is also time as textual. Okay. Uh, time not as a part of simply a part of reality, okay. but time also as something that comes to us through language. Okay. Time which has its own discourses right? and in that sense time is textual, right? because through language we talk about time, we make demarcations. right? So, in that sense time is not uh, you know, uh, so to speak, a real entity. Okay, we remember Immanuel Kant had pro problematized this whole concept of time being real, being a real entity, by saying that time is there as a cognitive schema, a priori cognitive schema in our our mind, so to speak. Post-structuralism does the same thing, but by insisting not or on it as a cognitive schema, but by insisting that time is a matter of language, is a matter of discourse and ultimately time is 
also textual. So, you see how these various uh, you know schools of thought have rendered time a problem. Now, quickly quoting from uh, Susan Suleiman in uh, you know uh, her theorizing of time in postmodernism. She says that you know postmodernism as um, uh, you know as a movement or as a school of thought uh, is one that is conditioned or determined or, uh, or has as its characteristic what she calls a, a extreme self consciousness okay, as if you are uh, is kind of implosion so to speak an implosion onto itself okay, um, as if you know culture thinking knowledge being very self conscious about itself self reflexive looking inward into itself okay so she calls postmodernism a moment right a moment in the sense that a, 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 a time okay in in the history of human thinking or in the history of ideas calls it a moment of extreme self consciousness let's look at this slide here a moment of extreme self consciousness about what when the present Okay, look at this, when the present takes to reflecting on its relation to the past. Right? So, here is a, a scholar talking about postmodernism post in terms of time. So, what is this moment or time of postmodernism? It is a time in the history of ideas, in the history of, of knowledge, okay, where um, there is an extreme self consciousness. Okay, uh, about about time uh, when we in our present okay reflect on our relationship to the past and on our relationship as it says here to the future, primarily as a problem of representation. Okay, you remember we we devoted two lectures, two lessons to to representation, and uh, she brings in postmodernism and cultural studies very beautifully here. Okay, so postmodernism is defined uh, as a problem of you know <laughs> as looking at the problem of representation right and looking at time and its relation to the present and uh, of us in time to the present and to the to the uh, sorry to the past and to the future as a problem of representation therefore it is seen time is seen as a problem of representation okay in the same way much in the same way as the body is seen uh, as a problem of representation as space is seen as a problem of representation. Okay. So, uh, also Cavalier also has to comment um, has made this comment on postmodernism in his text. Now, let us see how Cavalier has articulated this. He says postmodernism has questioned drastically let us look at this questioned drastically both linear an evolutionary approaches to history, okay, which as I said was a traditionalist approach to history. Okay. Postmodernism uh, is the school of thought which questions linear, linear, linearity, which questions uh, the evolutionary progressive sort of you know um, human uh, as human progress as hurt linked so to speak to, to a desired end, a designated end. Okay. This is something that has been uh, this linear narrative of time okay, something that has been as he says Cavallaro says drastically conditioned or, or sorry drastically questioned uh, by postmodernism. Now, let us look at this again how by arguing that there is no incontrovertible evidence of either progress or of the gradual revelation of reason. This is important okay. in enlightenment thinking in enlightenment thinking we found, we know that the two most important characteristics or we say the two most important tropes or uh, two most important frameworks were those of were those of progress and those of reason reason was paramount in enlightenment thinking the march of history so to speak was seen as the grand narrative of the march uh, you know from a lesser um, you know way of being to a more pro you know to to a, to a series of progresses so to speak that human life human history human civilization makes so that we see the march of history as you know a linear progress 
So, postmodernism by problematizing and as we saw in Suleiman's case for instance, Susan Suleiman's case that the whole idea of history, past, present, future has been rendered into a problem of representation. Uh, here also as Cavallero says the whole idea of reason uh, of gradual as he says gra gradual revelation of reason from epoch to epoch reason is going to uh, you know uh, 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 going to get better and better uh, there is going to be progress. Okay. History has also shown us that uh, human civilization has not been so right that there were you know uh, there were periods of uh, great reason followed by times of great unreason okay, of uh, many happenings in um, happenings in history which have nothing to do with the unfolding gradual unfolding of a progressive reason so to speak. Okay. So, you see uh, these are central questions and I would say these are these are highly problematic areas how you know. So, the way as again mentioned by um, by in one of the slides a, a while ago also if you are a person um, who has more or less a teleological understanding of human life of human history of time okay, then your perception about uh, not just time your perception about yourself your perception about others would be colored so to speak or other would be determined by that sort of an understanding. Okay. So, every action that you perform or everything uh, you know that happens in, in uh, you know in uh, has happened in the past or ha has ha is happening in, uh, in present or will or will for that matter will happen in the future you will see these as having a reason. Okay, having a purpose behind it if you are so to speak a teleologist. If you are not a teleologist, if you are you know basically you belong to the framework of postmodernism, then you are going to a see all these things to do with time, progress, reason, uh, everything as simply a matter of representation or representing uh, ourselves or representing the universe as a matter also uh, of discourse of talking about these things of talk, talking about time, past, present, history, narrative etcetera okay. and, and also secondly you are not going to be a linearist so to speak okay. and you are not going to see our lives as informed as history uh, informed as a gradually get you know a gradual process where reason gets better and better where, where progress is linear and gets better and better. Okay. So, the I feel among all these topics uh, you know to do with cultural studies. The question of time as dealt with in cultural studies, uh, there is no doubt that the ultimate question is who has put it to use you know to what use the our understandings of time. Uh, but I also feel that this is an area which is closest to philosophy right uh, and that is why some of the cases you find that I have also referred to how philosophers have talked about time. Again another scholar Linda, Hutch, Linda Hutchin okay, who um, uh, talks about the politics of postmodernism. Now, let us read uh, what Hutchin has to say. Okay. Now, how, this is a question, an important question she asks how can the present know the past that it tells. So, if you are writing in the present about the past now in the first place how can you know everything about the past. Okay, so, it seems to be a very simple question, but the point is how does she says how does the present you know know the past that it tells. If you talk about the past you are talking about it from the present. Okay. Then she says we constantly narrate the past, but what are the conditions this is an important word what are the conditions of the knowledge implied by this what she calls totalizing act of narration. Okay. We constantly narrate the past history constantly re, so, to, so to speak um, says that it recreates the past okay, that we can know the past even if we are in the present. This act this act of narrating the past from the present she calls it a totalizing act of narration with all the shades of you know meaning that totalizing can have including I would say is tyrann tyrannous aspect. Okay. So, this act of narration from the present about the past is a difficult one, it is a problematic one why because simply because it is an act of narration where we think that the historian okay, or the person who is writing about the past okay, will give us the final 
verdict about the past, which she calls a totalizing act of narration. Okay? So, this totalizing act of narrating the past is in fact an illusion, okay? uh, where this whole attempt to show that one knows the past is at once you know problematized by the fact this is the first in fact this is the first question how can the present know how can the present know the past it tells okay then uh, further she says do we know the past only through the present these are questions we should ask ourselves questions that historians should ask themselves do we know the past only through the present or is it a matter of only being able to understand the present through the past? Okay, then look at how beautifully said. Again, echoes of T. S. Eliot's poetry, uh, or uh, you know the, the poem that we saw, the extract from the poem. Okay, uh, what should we say? Is it that we know the past only through the present? Right? Isn't it also a fact that we know the present only through our past? Um, so, I hope you can understand how beautifully Hutchin has put it here that the present is again not, not something you know uh, is an illusion to think that you know you have all the power of narration standing in the vantage so, so some sort of a vantage point of the present. The present is not a vantage point, the present is not a privileged point, the present from which the historian narrates the past the person narrates the past is not a privileged moment. Why? Because the present is also known or understood in terms of the past. Okay? So, this conflating, we may say the conflating of the present, the past, the future okay, into uh, an, a sort of ambiguity, ambivalence where you cannot uh, you know kind of cannot really pare it down into this is past, this is present, this is future. All this is uh, has all been uh, you know uh, the contribution from the school of thought or this movement known as postmodernism. Therefore, time and historiography okay, historiography is the, that is the writing of history okay. time and historiography simply put historiography if graphi, graphos is writing then historiography is the writing of history. So, uh, or also history writing about itself if you if you will time and historiography uh, have have usually okay, lo been looked through the lenses of uh, the framework of origins, okay, through an originary framework, evolution, uh, through teleology and through destiny. So, this is something that has been has been almost discarded today. Right? Then uh, we will end with Michel Foucault again. Foucault, as you know, has been um, constantly with us in our uh, lessons in cultural studies. Foucault offered another way of looking at history. Okay? He says that instead of the teleological approach, he offered what is called the genealogical of, uh, approach. So where the where the you know the the non you know the very unproblematic linear way of progress is now replaced by what he says is the genealogical approach and what are quickly what are the we do not have time to look at it in detail, but quickly the characteristics of the genealogical method are very different or almost opposite those of the teleological approach. Now, he says that the, this way of looking at history is certainly non teleological, it is haphazard history, history that does not have a long you know on an, an um, uh, uh, a non punctuated way of looking at uh, you know progress. Uh, events are entangled, they need not have any direct easy causality about them as we understand history okay, or been taught history in our schools, then there are deviations, there are reversals, errors and reappraisals. So, it may seem to be a very chaotic uh, way of looking at history, nevertheless Foucault would say that this is the real thing. Okay. All our constructions of, of uh, you know of, of a very ordered way of looking at history is an illusion, the reality is that it is always chaotic and we it is only us only we who who impose a sort of clean say clean narrative on history. So, these are non teleological haphazard and entangled with no pure causality so to speak. Okay. So, therefore, very quickly Foucault says the purpose of history guided by genealogy is not to discover the roots of our identity even the roots question of roots is very problematic, but to commit itself to its dissipation. 
Okay. It does not seek to define our unique thres threshold of emergence, the homeland to which metaphysicians promise a return. It seeks to make visible the, all those discontinuities that cross us. Okay. So, history is all about time is about discontinuities and not very easily related, um, uh, related uh, causes and their results. Right. So, Hayden White is another you know if you want to do further studies uh, is another scholar who has looked at history similarly in uh, terms of randomness uh, as something that is non idealized and discontinuous. Right. Let us look quickly at some of you know uh, the questions that we may formulate here. Right. For instance, um, if I if you get a question like what are the two views of time in philosophy not just in cultural studies the two views of time we saw are uh, may be broadly defined as a static view and the dynamic view the static view holds with philosophers like Parmenides that real objects are immutable uh, you know time in 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 um, in a certain realm okay uh, things do not change what are called real objects do not change right okay uh, on the other hand with heraclitus we also can look at philosophy has looked at time as something dynamic in which the famous statement uh, we've seen the that one cannot uh, step into the same river twice the time is always flowing and time is always dynamic next what are the issues in should be in here in relation to time that are the concerns of cultural studies. Okay. So, we talk generally about philosophy. So, what exactly is the point at which cultural studies is going to come in? Now, the most important here is this point, how do we understand time in relation to human activities and not questions like you know cultural studies does not deal with questions like what are the fundamental features of time, which is something that the physicists may study. Okay. How is time social? How is you know time what what is the role of time and our our understanding of time of the of the past of the present and of the future okay uh, how what implications does does our understanding of such things of time past present and future of history have uh, how does it bear upon us in our human activities that is the most important question followed by this important corollary which is and how have these various understandings been put to political views by people by different ag agencies. Okay. So, how are we asked to sort of subscribe to a certain view of time because that certain view of time is going to determine our future actions. Okay. So, these these are the particular questions raised in regard to time by cultural studies. Then how does postmodernism problematize the traditional views of time? Postmodernism is as we saw makes very radical raises some radical questions to do with time especially uh, you know dismissing the dismissing the traditionalist views of time as teleological uh, time as a linear as progressive okay it also looks at time as textual time as a matter of discourse uh, and uh, not as time as in reality okay by the time it comes to our cultural lives time becomes a matter of discourse and time becomes textual okay uh, and also we saw in postmodernism there is a uh, following Susan Suleiman there is a uh, there is a heightened self consciousness regarding the, uh, the the past and the present and the future and the relationship between them and what it has to do with uh, you know how it is a problem of representation of these things. Then uh, finally, how does the genealogical view of time? with regard to traditional his, uh, differ with regard to traditional historiography the te, or rather the teleological school as given to us by Michel Foucault. And finally, we end with this today Michel Foucault gave us the genealogical view in uh, distinction to the teleological view and where uh, you know it where we find that things are uh, almost the opposite of the teleological view where things are not originary origins matter of origins roots do not matter. Okay. It is an avowal and understanding of history of time as random as filled with errors as it says here with deviations the writing of history should also be characterized by this realization of our fact that history is non teleological there are haphazard events where causality of events is highly problematic and uh, you know highly over determined so to speak okay highly over determined and uh, there are events that are entangled events that you that are so entangled where time again time present 
and time future and time past are so entangled that you cannot really break it up and unpack them to uh, you know to make it a very convenient beautiful um, a sweet story of progress okay so uh, we will end here and uh, I am going to link this in, uh, in a uh, time in my next lecture, a couple of slides which I left out, I will carry them over to the next lecture, because the next lecture is to do with the IP of development in cultural studies, okay? where time will also, we will begin with an understanding of time, uh, history and development, okay? as looked at from the cultural studies point of view, where culture is the paramount. Uh, uh, you know, is a reference point as far as development is concerned. So, I hope uh, you know, I have at least been able to um, make you begin to think about uh, you know, uh, how difficult it is to talk about time and to make you understand that it is perhaps uh, you know, it is perhaps time for us, okay? it is time for us to do away with old traditional concepts of time as being linear and unfolding where reason unfolds in a better way epoch after epoch and uh, to at least to understand to appreciate the fact that time may be as far as it has implications for our social uh, social lives as how we live out our lives our cultural lives are you know this is fraught with so many questions that is it, it we should begin to at least think um, carefully about what idea of time we consume what idea of time we adopt. Why? Because as was mentioned here in this lesson, it has it also determines the way we look at ourselves and our perceptions about others and the universe. Thank you so much.